So hi there, I'm Stephen Chia and welcome back to Heart of the Matter. Now, in recent months, we've been hearing talk about, you know, the worsening state of Singapore's cleanliness and public hygiene. Senior Parliamentary Secretary for Sustainability and the Environment, Bayam Keng said in Parliament that, that feedback on littering has increased some 15% from 2022 to 2023. Pest controllers have also said that, you know, the reports have been going up that they are receiving 30 to 40% more rodent-related inquiries in the past few months. So why has Singapore gotten dirtier? What can we do to get people to clean up their act, so to speak? Okay, welcome everyone. So yeah, I mean, uh, there's no denying it. Singapore is known as a clean and green city. But then when you do make a visit to one of our uh, public toilets at the Hawker Centre, um, things don't seem so clean and green there, especially. <laughs> so so Andrew, I'll start with you. Why do we still seem to have a cleanliness problem, you know, especially in certain parts of our country? In the first inaugural Keep Singapore Clean campaign, which is launched in 1968 by our first Prime Minister, uh, Mr. the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, his intention was to uh, to get the citizens to keep the environment clean. Environment doesn't mean only the cleanliness of the environment, but also the toilet. So if you look at what he was one, what he wanted to do was actually to uh, set the motion to make sure that you know everybody clean up by themselves rather than. Uh, mm-hmm. engaging people however that momentum has uh, you know a loss because i think since then we have we have come to adopt to engaging uh, cleaning you know cleaning okay. workforce to do things for us cleaning force has also been dwindling over the years because of aging population yeah so i think uh, we also lack a bit of civic mindedness uh, okay. in worrying understanding of uh, what what really to do things to be clean. So so yeah. you're saying that actually because we have cleaners doing much of the work, yeah. we are not cleaning up after ourselves. I think that is a true case or, or majority that we are okay. actually uh, adopting uh, right. to, to say that no, there's other, there are people that is cleaning after us. Uh, so why okay, so, so if that's a situation, yeah. then we can only expect things to get worse because we know you know, the population is dwindling, we, yeah, we, the yeah, clean yeah. number of cleaners also are dwindling. Yeah, so, yeah. so it sounds like this could be a long-term problem. Let, let's get some numbers because, uh, Rosie, I'll come to you, because you were doing a nationwide study uh, that SMU did on public hygiene in our coffee shops and our hawker centres. I think you studied more than 1,000 public toilets in Singapore, surveyed over 9,000 people. And yeah, maybe tell us what were some of the results because I understand more than 60% said that public toilets in these places are either dirtier or just as dirty as they were in 2020. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, We studied thousands of toilets around Singapore, all the coffee shops and hawker centres we visited. And we even interviewed the workers at these places as well as uh, the patrons there, as well as the general public. And all in, we found that the coffee shop toilets are rated just as dirty as they were in 2020, which is definitely below the 50% 50 mark. It's not all gruesome, but there are some bright sparks here and there. But uh, even the workers at these places, um, 89% of these workers at coffee shops and hawker centres, they use these toilets at their premises, is what they say. And uh, more than 9,000 people asked for their views. 91% of them say that the toilets in these places need major overhauling. They rate them as dirty. Um, It's also a a point of note that the um, workers view them as less dirty as compared to the customers, likely because the workers have their bosses watching them and also (laughs) these workers, uh, somehow they have to use these toilets at these places. Well, what's of concern is that um, the closer these toilets are to the cooking facilities, the dirtier these toilets are, factually speaking. Oh. And that's of great concern for public sanitation because it's these very workers who are handling the food served at these premises. Yeah, indeed. Wow. Okay, that's surprising. So the closer they are to the food stores, the dirtier they were. That That's even more scary. Yes, we have photographic footage of all the, let's say, the raw chickens all hanging yeah, yeah. Oh. right outside the toilet. <laughs> you know what? It's okay. I think we can all paint the picture in our minds as you, you just mentioned it and, and we're thinking, yeah, no. Okay, never mind. An image we cannot forget. Um, would you say any of this has to do with the infrastructure, the way the toilets were built, or is it 
just because of the users? It's, it's both. I think it starts off with the infrastructure and the design. Many of these places were built what, decades ago, and they're largely very cramped, very narrow to begin with. There's hardly any space to maneuver. So even if you're mm. talking about having these robot clean, robotic cleans, robot, robots as cleaners, the robots cannot fit into these uh, tiny little spaces. Uh, they are cramped, um, wet, poorly lit, and uh, the toilet seats are um, stained with, I think we can all can paint the picture here, of things <laughs> that should have been flushed away long ago. Yeah, not, not a pretty picture at all. Yeah, definitely not. So, so Serene, I mean, if we think about it this way, how, I mean, is this a, a user, user issue as well? I think when people are in an environment where the line between what is acceptable and what is considered litter or dirty is grey, that's when people can rationalise that their behaviour is actually not antisocial. Right? So I think what Rosie says is really interesting, right? where the, the areas where you're doing food prep and where your toilets are, someone could very easily say, oh, but where else would I prepare my food? So this is just a, a natural consequence of me using the area for for cooking and prepping. And so I'm not actually littering, right? This is just a, the nature of my work. Um, I think we can all agree that there are certain things where we can consider as definitively dirty. So like you wouldn't throw a bag of rubbish because that's clearly litter. Yeah. But say you were having, let's say, a barbecue at East Coast Park and you leave like, you know, your paper plates on the table after you've cleared up. Um, or let's say you're dusting your, your car mats at the car park. Is that littering? Mm. It, it's grey, right? And so as long as there's room for people to sort of rationalise away the antisocial behaviour, then it begets sort of like the, the habit of like, you know, every time I go to a public car park, that's where I'm going to dust my, my, um, my mats. Because it's, it's not technically littering. I haven't like thrown... Um, you know, like uh, an empty an, an empty cup away. Yeah, right. But I guess because you're you're imagining dust from a mat is just dust. It's not like yes. if I had actual rubbish, tissue papers, and all that all over my mat, and I dusted it, then yeah, people would say that's littering. Yeah, because when there's a grey area, like like it's like it's like what Rosie said, right? It's this is food that I'm preparing for my customers. It is something that happens a matter of fact if I am cooking. It's not littering. And so I'm not actually dirtying the place. Okay. And so when you can sort of like think about it that way, I mean, there's a, a room for people to negotiate it away as litter. Um, it becomes harder to tell people that they've done something wrong because they don't actually think that they've done something wrong. I'm thinking, you know, as, as a just a normal user, if I go into a nice clean toilet, I generally try and keep it clean too. But if I go yeah. into a filthy toilet, I don't try too hard to keep it clean. Is that also the same behavior? Because... Yeah, you know, it's already dirty, so I figured, oh well, no diff if I, if I, you know, so called yeah. uh, a miss and piss on the floor, or I leave my tissue behind on the floor, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a fairly controversial theory about broken windows um, that criminologists have used, right? Which is that if you go into a neighborhood that has one single broken window, then it signify it, it signals that that place is not uh, patrolled. It signals that the place is not cared for, and so then vandalism takes place, and because it's ignored, so it's called the broken window right. theory. Now it is not um, unproblematic, but some aspects of it I think are true. Exactly what you said. If the place is already clean, I'm not going to be that first person to dirty the toilet. But if the toilet is not clean, clearly no one cares because. It's not clean. And if no one cares, why should I be the first person to care? Mm. Um, it obviously sounds very irrational. It sounds very antisocial. But from a human behavior perspective, it's also quite, yeah, that makes sense. And so, I mean, whose responsibility is it to be that first person to clean? Obviously, we can have a discussion whether it's cleaners, whether we have, as a, a country, we have sort of like divested the responsibility to our cleaners. Um, but the, the theory of sort of like, you know, if you go into a clean place, you want to keep it clean. You go into a dirty place and you don't feel the same um, impetus. That's very real. Okay. Andrew, so how? <laughs> <laughs> because I remember at one time, you know, the, we had uh, Jack Sim with the World Toilet Organization. He was on a mission to clean up all our toilets. Some got refurbished. They were nicer. But I've seen some of these... Uh, renovated ones, they still end up being dirty after a period of time. The environment that we live in and also because of, I think, the users themselves and, of course, if it's a clean toilet, 
the owners of the coffee shop or the operators would actually maintain it proper. But I think uh, down here we have, you know, uh, public users for such to coffee shop toilets. And and recently what we did was actually to uh, to bring the coffee shop operators as well as the the neighborhood uh, community, uh, you know, uh, volunteers to come in to actually participate in a program whereby they look out for each other to ensure that the toilets are actually um, in a in a clean in a clean uh, 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 environment so that you know when people use it, uh, it, it, it actually you feel comfortable. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So you need that kind of uh, hand holding uh, from the from the user as well as the operators to actually come in to work together. Uh, I also agree with uh, Rosie that you know um, some of this this um, infrastructure has been is is old, uh, and of course um, you need to refurbish over a period of time. Uh, and so, hopefully that uh, you know this this refurbishment will actually take place, and then hopefully there's pride in the operators mm. to really look at. Um, not only the stores themselves, the variety, but also the the essential services like the toilets. I know over a period of time, the government has gone around to renovate and upgrade all our hawker centres, including the wet markets. And and the wet markets are, are in a way, not as wet as they used to be anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. there's better drainage, uh, which I think uh, it, it works. Um, Rosie, give us some idea because your study also looked at different areas and yeah. there were some areas that were much cleaner than others, right? Yeah, there were. Um, firstly, let me say that the Hawker Centre toilets were much cleaner last year as compared to 2020. So they made a very laudable U-turn on the Toilet okay. Cleanliness Index. Hawker Centre toilets have improved significantly um, compared to 2020 when they were very bad. They fell from 2016 to 2020 and they rose again uh, till, uh, until last year. However, coffee shop toilets have stayed equally bad. When we compare areas around Singapore, I can look at the map right here, and uh, it is actually at toiletstatistics.com, which is what I host uh, for public consumption. Uh, most of the map of Singapore is colored orange to red. That's not so good, right? Not great, yeah, not great. The only blue area would be the uh, around the water catchment area. Marina South uh, would be the best as, as well. The bottom three was... Bottom three comprised uh, Pioneer, Ubi, as well as uh, around the Singapore River area. Ooh. Well, thank goodness it's near the water catchment area that's clean because that is where the water that we drink it, it <laughs> kind of originates from, right? That's actually a really interesting um, statistic, Rosie. And, and I wonder whether looking at these areas actually tells us a little bit about the relationship that people have with these spaces. Um, and I, I really like what Andrew said just now about engaging the community because a lot of what we know, not specifically from littering, but just people's ownership of space um, tells us that the, the greater attachment people feel to a location, the more likely they are to take care of it. It's quite natural, right? Like you take care of your, your own home, you're less likely to take care of like common areas. So if we bring this back to what Rosie has said just now, um, the places that she's highlighted as being the ones that are dirtiest, like Ubi and the, the National River, uh, the Singapore River, Ubi, if you think about it, is very industrial, which means people only basically work there, right? Not, not very many people live in the, the Ubi area. Um, and also, the Singapore River is highly commercial. We have lots of tourists, maybe, uh, people who work there. Right. And so the relationship that people have with these spaces is very transient. You don't live there, right? You come and you go. And so the attachment that you might feel to that space is quite different than, say, your home. Whereas our water catchment area, from young in school, we have known that we have such... Th these areas are precious to Singapore, Right. And so and when you go to these water catchment areas, these are places that afford you rest, relaxation. And so we feel a sense of emotional attachment to these places. And so we want to take care right. of it. And so I'm not surprised. In fact, this is actually really good news, right? Because it gives us a sense of like, well, if we want people to take care of the areas around us, maybe before we teach them not to litter, we should teach them to care about these spaces so that we can develop this sort of like right. warm feelings towards it. And then the, the anti-littering part and the taking care of the, the space part will just come naturally from that. I would argue that actually we, we are doing that already. I mean, in, in much of Singapore, well, Singaporeans, we're very, we don't litter. I mean, I've gone overseas, carried trash with me looking for a dustbin, unable to find it and just unable to just 
let go of it <laughs> onto the street <laughs> because I'm so used to it, you know? So I think we have achieved that. But when we talk about hygiene, especially in toilets or in coffee shops, certain areas and parts, of, so it, it seems specific to certain parts of Singapore. Is that right, Andrew? I mean, because if you look at our streets on Orchard Road and in general, you know, CBD and all that, it's generally very clean. So, and, and when we talk about rats and things like that, also it has to do with where there is uh, food waste often, there'll be back alleys. So are we kind of really looking, talking about quite uh, specific areas here? Um, Steve, I'm actually quite sad to tell you that uh, we have a huge number of cleaners uh, that uh, actually comes out early in the morning whereby you don't see them and mm. you only see them uh, you know, um, late in the night or early in the morning cleaning up. And when we start going out from our house or houses, uh, you see that it's clean. So I think so it's, it's an illusion you're telling me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not real. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is we really have a lot of uh, cleaners uh, out on the okay. streets. Uh. Especially in Orchard Road. I think Orchard Road is branded as, you know, our tourist belt. Uh, and and you know that, you know, that kind of areas, uh, you cannot have, uh, you know... Uh, okay, so, any, so you're saying without these feedback. cleaners, yeah. without these cleaners, yeah. it would not be the same clean and green city that we're talking about? I, I can bet you, yes, it will not be, yeah. Ah, okay. So then, then we talk about what do we need to do? So we've talked about, you know, public education. But what about, you know, we also have very strict laws fines yeah uh, it's a $300 fine for first time offenders and there's talk of increasing enforcement blitz you know adding more CCTVs catching more people I mean really is that the way to go Andrew what do you think it's, it's like if you see an amber light and you try to run it the traffic light littering and all this is the same you know if you don't get caught it doesn't matter but when you get caught I think mm. imposition of steeper fines and even you know uh, you know your community work orders will actually help to try to prevent people from you know uh, doing it again basically okay. yeah Serene, do you agree this sort of behavioral <laughs> management I think I'm slightly on the fence I think I think Andrew's First, right, that if people can get away with it, um, then they will, they, they will try to beat the red light, right? So, um, I mean, from research, we know that the, the certainty of being caught is actually a greater deterrent than the severity of the fine, which means you can find people as, as high as you want, but if they can get away with it or they know of people who have gotten away with it, then the, the fine isn't going to be as huge of a deterrent. So that, that's one thing. So, so the shaming in that sense is more of a deterrent than the money, right? Honestly, if you ask me, I'm not even sure if CWO is that much of a shame. So if you think about it, like, why, why would it be shameful? In order for something to be shameful, people need to recognize you and you need to be identifiable. Right. But if people are doing a one-off CW on Orchard Road, nobody sees them, they're wearing a cap and a mask, then how is it shameful? In fact, if you ask me, I think the thing that makes CWO much more a deterrent is the fact that it's troublesome. Ah. That I have to like take the time out of my day to do this rather than the fact that I'm wearing a pink vest. Because if no one can recognize me, I'm just a random CWO offender, I'll do it and then that's it. Lah. You know? Or maybe if I'm a celebrity, right? And, and then I'm a very easily recognizable face and people see me doing this, then yes, I, I do think that the shame is going to be quite powerful. But if I'm just a nobody, if Serene Ko goes out and does a CWO and someone sees me and they don't know who I am, I'm not sure... They may just think you're a regular worker and that this is actually your job. Or, or that I'm an offender, but they'll see me in the moment and then they won't think of me ever again, right? And so the, the shame part doesn't quite play that same role, I suspect. But I guess the question would be, yeah, how, how far do we want to take this? I mean, if we really don't want to shame people, yeah, there are many ways you can yeah. seriously <laughs> shame them, but... Does that really, uh, you know, in the long term, achieve our objective of having a, a cleaner city, right? And I guess there are concerns that if some people have uh, mental health issues, they may do it unknowingly. Are we able to discern whether they intentionally littered or not? I think I want to pick out on another thing that um, Andrew talked about, right, which is that whether or not um, a fine or doing CWO necessarily prevents them from doing it again. So it might punish them for the offence that they have committed. But to what extent do we actually think that it prevents them from doing it one more time after? So those are two different things, right? One is a yeah. punishment for an act. The other is a deterrent for a future act. So it, 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 I'm not sure. So it might feel that, oh, I'm, I'm, 
I yeah I did something wrong. But do we think that actually just finding someone or getting them to do CW, the connection between that and not doing it again, is mm. there a positive element to it? Like, do we teach people also that it is not wrong or it is wrong or that there's something else that they could have done? Right. So we we correlate or we associate the punishment with yes, they're not going to do it again. Uh, I'm not so sure. Like, I think it's a punishment, not necessarily a deterrent. So in a way, it's like, uh, I know people who have uh, accumulated too many demerit points on their driving license. They have to go for like, I think a one day... Safe driving course. Uh, class, you know, yeah, tr- yeah retraining yeah, sort of thing. So mm-hmm. I think the pain of doing that class, they say, because it's nothing earth shattering. The information is just a reminder of what you shouldn't do and... Yeah, like like Serene said earlier, is that inconvenience of going there, sitting for a day, listening listening to stuff that you already know, and telling yourself, okay, like, <laughs> I, I I think I know why I'm here, right? You know, you understand what you've done wrong, and you probably won't do that wrong again because of that pain. Whereas just cleaning the streets, I don't know if had the same deterrence. I'm just suggesting. I'm just thinking about it. If it's let's say you you're an offender and. Uh, you don't go by yourself, but you go by your whole family. Your your children goes with you. I don't know whether it works or not because Ooh. children always plays a part in our life and it shapes us into what we do. Uh, just take for example, what we are trying to do now with the school children is to actually train them to uh, in this program called the Body Clean uh, Workshop. And within there, there's a module that is, helps them to actually uh, to uh, a pilot module, uh, okay, to look at uh, cleanliness of the toilet. Mm-hmm. Not really washing the toilet, but at least knowing that things must be in proper order so that the toilet can actually function properly. So, so this kind of training for the young can actually also be, you know, transferred to the parents or to to the family members. And if there is a shame to be done, perhaps I don't know, but. The whole family right. do it, nah. Then, wow. then the pain, the pain is yes. not necessarily the one person, but is the whole family going together, mm. even with your mate, <laughs> yeah. So, so how do you? I mean, then. I do not know whether there'll, there'll be a deterrent or not. Yeah, well, yeah. that's a, definitely an idea to think about. It does bring a different dimension to that sort of uh, deterrent. You know, but that's almost like saying because you're the CEO of the company, anything your guys do wrong, you also yeah, have you to go have and... To accept. Yeah, you still have yeah. to accept it. Many people will also be saying, guys, Singapore is already so clean. <laughs> I mean, on the larger scheme of things, are we just, is this a mountain in a molehill? Are we just picking, nitpicking on many things? I mean, no one's dying from the, the <laughs> things that are happening here, you know, so, and, and in a way, some dirt adds a bit of character and charm to the city. <laughs> Andrew, how would you respond? <laughs> I think it's sustainability. Uh, for me, being a clean city or clean country, we need to sustain uh, like I said, you know, uh, the first uh, inaugural Keep Singapore Clean was 1968. And up to today, uh, we have actually, you know, uh, took a two few steps backwards. Uh, but we cannot afford that because I think our, our you know, little rate drop thrives on, on, you know, investment, productivity and everything. And you just can't have uh, okay. such, uh, you know, uh, bad habits, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, so the long-term consequences. Correct, correct. Yeah. Serene, what do you think? I think the, the thing which troubles me, I suppose, is what Andrew mentioned just now, which is that in order for us to be this clean, it actually depends on an army of cleaners. And what happens if this, if this pipeline of cleaners dry up, right? Like at some point, we need to take responsibility for our own, for the cleanliness of our own country. And so um, while I agree with you to a degree that I, I don't think that we have as much of a problem as we do in many major cities in the world, I also don't think that we have internalized the responsibility of taking care of our environment quite the same way as, say, places like Japan, for instance, where they, right. they have cleaners, but I don't think to the degree that we do. And the public education there, you know, when it comes to like getting their kids to take care of their classrooms and everything else um, is something that has, you know, had a legacy for, for, for quite a long time. And so the, the sustainability of it, whose responsibility is it, who do we depend on? If, if, for instance, and this is just a hypothetical, right? If we had one day where the cleaners did nothing, right? Would Singapore be able to sort of like live up to that? Like what if one day the workers just didn't do anything? Like, like what Andrew says, right? That's when you true. wake up in the morning and like the, the roads haven't been cleaned, 
right? Like, what would that what would that version of Singapore look like? And that might actually be a wake up call for us to say, in order for the country to be the 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 cl- the, cl- mm-hmm. the cleanliness that it is, it actually took right. you know an army of like hundreds and thousands of cleaners to have done this, and yeah. we take them for granted. That is true. We definitely take it for granted. Just to let you know, the average uh, you know, local cleaner, average age is about 70. And we have about 50,000, 57,000 to 60,000 cleaners. And uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, all these uncles, aunties, do, they do have aches and pains. Uh, so you don't be surprised one day uh, they are not coming to work. Uh, and that's where <laughs> right. the results come out. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Rosie, any last thoughts? Yeah, I can only speak for toilets because my studies have always been on toilets in coffee shops and hawker centres. Um, hawker centres have improved, but coffee shops haven't. They've remained... Uh, well, we all know they've been <laughs> woefully dirty all these years, ever since I began in 2015. How do we go about tackling this problem? Uh, we know that they're hardly clean because when you see the cleaning schedules, they're either not present yeah. or not updated. Um, hence, is there any cleaning done in the first place? And these coffee shop owners, what are they doing about okay. this? Despite all the toilet improvement programs that have been around since 2020 and so on. Um, you know, the way we rate the cleanliness of our stalls, for example, like A or B or C, I think Andrew, you, you know a lot about that. Can we do the same for toilets in that particular you know, that say that particular coffee shop, and you can rate the cleanliness of toilets with an A rating or B rating or C rating, apart from the food stall cleanliness rating. Yeah, and, and I think there was a, a sort of a movement like that, but I don't know if it ever became uh, formalized. I don't think it's ever been done. And our Minister Grace Wu has also, Minister for Sustainability and Environment, said in January that coffee shops should clean their toilets every half an hour. Okay, so it sounds like, yeah, there's definitely some work to be done. And I, I think it's true that there aren't really like spot checks, inspections on, on toilets and hawker centres. So that might be something, uh, you know, the NEA would have to think about. And maybe the yeah, the chairman of the Public Hygiene Council can remind them. <laughs> oh, definitely, <laughs> well, I will. Definitely. I, I use the coffee shop toilets myself too. All right. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. But thank you all for coming, uh, for sharing your thoughts on this issue. I mean, it's... Uh, it doesn't seem like one that is so urgent, but at the same time, it is very important. And in the bigger scheme of things, we do not, uh, it can make a big difference. So thank you all for sharing your thoughts. And to all of you who are listening in, please uh, uh, do send us any feedback or thoughts on this. If you have, you can find us on all the usual social media platforms. Also, a shout out to the CNA podcast team, Tiffany Ang, Junaini Johari, Sayawin, Joanne Chan, and Crispina Robert. And I'm Stephen Shah saying bye for now.